So today we're going to be talking about vectors and coordinate systems. Okay. Now a lot of the uh, some of this stuff you should you should know already. Okay. All right, let's uh, get this out of the way. Okay. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about vectors, some of which you know already: scalars and vectors, how we notate vectors, how we add them together, how we decompose them. Okay. And then relative and absolute displacement. We're then going to cover something which is perhaps new to you, which is how to multiply vectors together. Okay? Um, that is quite um, hard work. Okay? There's quite a bit of equations going on. But it's a bit like going to the dentist. You know, once the pain is out of the way, it soon diminishes, and you'll, and you'll know how to multiply vectors. Okay? And then we're going to cover right-handed coordinate systems, which is sort of the basis of all the coordinate systems that we use in dynamics. Okay, so vectors and scalars. Well, scalars... Essentially, there are two quantities in physics. Scalars are one of them, and basically, they're, they're just a, a, a quantity that's determined by just one number. Okay? And so a scalar is something like mass, or temperature, or speed. Okay? We know if something's 5 kilograms, we know it's 5 kilograms. There's nothing more we need to know about that mass. Okay? Now, the other type of quantity in physics okay, is where you need more than one number to fully describe it. Okay? And these are things like displacement, velocity, acceleration and force. These are all things that we deal with in dynamics. Okay? And they need both a magnitude, okay, which is how long something is or how far it goes, okay? and they also need a direction. Okay? So if, I, if I'm standing here, I walk two metres over to this way, okay? that's different from walking two metres over to this way. Okay? And so the, display, the magnitude of that was two metres, okay? and, uh, and so the displacement was two metres to, um, well, to your right. Okay? And then the second bit I did was two meters to your uh, left, which is, uh, which is different from the first one. Okay? Now, one of the th important things, how do, what about displacement? Okay? Well, if I walk two meters over this way, we know my displacement from the start point was two meters. Okay? Two meters to your right. Okay? And if I walk two meters this way, okay, what's my total displacement now? Zero, exactly. That's the difference. Okay? With distance, obviously, I've travelled four metres, but my total displacement was zero. Okay, so that's vectors. Okay, now, um, in the notes and uh, in textbooks, you'll often see um, vectors designated as, as boldface, okay, type. Um, you may also see underline type, okay, and the other form is with an arrow over the letter, okay. Now, generally, what I do is in text, I use boldface type, and in handwritten stuff, and you'll see that, um, we'll use an arrow over the letter, okay? Just, to, you know, basically, when, you know, when you're doing your assignment or, um, or in the exam, I want to know whether you're using a vector or not, and so you've got to bear that in mind. Okay. So, the first thing is vector addition, which you should all know by now. There's two methods, basically. Okay, there's a triangle method, where you put the end of one vector on the, on the start of the other one, Okay. And you put, line them up, and then your resultant R will be that one. The other method is a parallelogram method. A plus B equals R. And you know that R and R are the same thing. Okay? So that's essentially vector addition. Like I said, if you want more information, they're in the revision notes. Negative vectors. Well, if you add a vector to itself, but does, um, um, minus itself, then you end up getting zero. And a vector, essentially, A and minus A have the same magnitude. Okay? but they're negative, which means they have opposite directions, okay? And so when you add them together, you end up getting back to the start. Like, it's like I said, you walk two metres to the left, you get A. You walk two metres to the right, it's going to be minus A. You add them together, your total is zero, okay? Again, it's in the revision notes. Now, decomposing vectors. We've, we covered add addition of vectors, where you take two vectors, you add them together to get one vector, okay? Or we can do the same thing in reverse. You can take one vector and decompose it into constituent parts, okay? Now, what, what about constituent parts? Well, if you think about things, we, you know, we deal with things in three-dimensional space, okay? Now, the standard way of defining a position of something in three-dimensional space is by using three axes. And we know these as x, y, and z, Okay? And so here we've got some three axes, x, y, and z. And we've got point P, okay? Now, point P is our particle or whatever we want to measure. And vector A, we can call the displacement coefficient. So this is capital A, or uh, boldface A, is the displacement coefficient from the origin of our x, y, z coordinates to point P, okay? 
And we've got various things identified here. We've got AX, AY, and AZ. Well, they're the components along A, sorry, along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, which define that position point P, okay, and that vector A. We've also got these angles, theta, this is theta, and this is phi, okay, and they define the angle which vector A makes to the various axes, okay, we've got an angle between the z-axis and A, and we've got an angle between the x-axis and phi, and obviously this angle here, between the y-axis and, and, and uh, A, would obviously be uh, 90 minus phi, okay. So that's fully defined. We've now fully defined this vector. Okay. <coughs> and what we do now is we use AX and AZ and AY to form the basis of our decomposition. Now, before we can um, decompose this vector completely, we need to introduce the concept of what's known as unit vectors. Okay. And so unit vectors are these numbers here in red, I, J, and K. Okay. And they are of a length one. Okay. And they're along the X, Y, and Z axis. Okay. So they are noted as unit vectors, they have a length of one, and they lie on the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. And so we have, if we had a vector of one i, okay, so we know that obviously one is one, the magnitude is one, and we know that it's lying on the x-axis. If we had a vector of three k, okay, well we know that that's going to be three um, up the z-axis. This thing's decided not to work. Okay. And so we can decompose our position, our, our position, a, our displacement A, okay, into um, three vectors. What's going on now? Okay, so we've got A equals AX times I plus AY times J plus AZ times K, okay? K being, or IJ and K being the unit vectors, and A is the vector in total. And so the terms IX, I, IJ, I, Y, J, and I, Z, K are vectors with magnitudes A, X, A, Y, and A, Z lying along the three axes, X, Y, and Z, okay? So this is what's known as, a, a, as vector decomposition. So we've got, we had vector A to start with, and we've now decomposed it into three component parts. You add those together, you end up getting the total vector, okay? <coughs> so what about things like the magnitude of that, of that vector? Well, we had A. The magnitude is denoted by these two lines, either side of the vector, okay? And it's essentially, it's a bit like Pythagoras' rule, um, but in this case, it's three dimensions. You just square them, add them together, and then square root the whole lot, and you'll get the length of, of vector A, okay? And by definition, the magnitude of a vector is always positive, okay? It's, a, it's the direction that defines the sign that you have, okay? It's always positive. The angles theta and phi, they can be determined from trigonometry just by inspection. I'm sure you're all aware of that. So Katoa and all that sort of stuff. And you end up getting these angles uh, for theta and phi. You've got theta is the inverse cosine of AZ over the total magnitude of A. Okay, and phi is the tangent of AY divided by AX, or inverse tan tangent. Okay. Now, if we know the angles and the magnitude of alpha, so, so but that was the previous slide was covering um, how, do we de how do we determine the magnitude and the angles. But if we know those things, then how do we determine AX, AY, and AZ? And again, it's all from trigonometry. Okay, you can um, these are defined in your notes. Okay, and they should, like I said, just from inspection, you should be able to work all those terms out. So we've got AX is the magnitude of A times sine theta times cosine phi. AY is the magnitude of A sine theta sine phi, and AZ is just the magnitude times by the cosine of, of theta. Okay? Right, relative and absolute displacement. Okay? Now imagine we've got three vectors. Okay? Now note the way we've denoted these vectors. We've got the capital value, okay, R, but now we've got some subscripts, A naught, B A, and B naught, okay? Now, the way to remember which way around those letters go, and this is where the mistake is, I'll tell you in a second, okay, is you can imagine if you're posting a letter, you're posting a letter to somebody from you, okay? And so, that's, so here we've got vector 0a, okay? But we know, we denote that as r a naught. Vector is position a with respect to 0, okay? The same with r b a, well, that's the vector b, with respect to A, okay? So you always write it in that order. And again, the one from zero to B is um, position of B with respect to the zero, 
the origin. Okay? And so that's describing the same thing. RAO is a, um, the vector to give you the displacement A relative to O. RBO is the vector given the displacement of B relative to zero. Okay, and RBA is the vector um, given the displacement of B relative to A. Now, in your notes, okay, this is on page uh, 14, okay, um, you'll see the, the line saying simple vector addition gives RB equals RA plus RAB. I've made the classic mistake, okay, it should be RBA at the end of that equation, whereas you're on slide four, sorry, Page 9, slide 14, okay? <coughs> On page 9, slide 14, okay, there is an equation that says RB equals RA plus RAB, okay? That, should, that last term should be RBA, okay? So I've made this classic mistake of putting them the wrong way around. Okay. Well, what we can do is if we assume that um, zero is some point on the Earth's surface, say, okay, then that's a fixed point. We know where that point is, okay? And R A zero and R B zero will define exactly relative to that point where point A and point B are, okay? We know, because we know where zero is, we know where A and B are, okay? Because we know what those vectors are. But the vector um, connecting the, the A and B together, we know is what's known as a relative vector, okay? So if we move point zero, and we've picked another point, wherever that could be, A, B, or the vector from B, uh, to B from A, okay, R, B, A, will be the same. That's a relative uh, displacement. Whereas R, A, naught, and R, B, naught will change, okay? So that's just ways to think about vectors, okay? So R, B, A is a relative displacement, and anything with respect to an origin on the Earth's surface, say, okay, are known as absolute displacements. And because we know where this point is, we often refer to them as just RA and RB, okay? Because we know it's being connected to some point on Earth, okay? Now, if we do a little bit of mass with these, okay, we can see that RB, which is the, uh, the, from zero to B, is the same as RA plus RBA. If we go back to that slide, okay, if you, we want to find out what RB is, Perhaps from zero to B, okay, from here to here, okay, and that's obviously the same as this vector plus that vector. You get the same. You get the same answer, okay. And so by rearranging this equation, we can find out what our relative vector is, and that's basically the difference between the two ve two vectors, R B A equals R B minus R A, okay. And this is where the order of the subscripts come in useful, okay, because relative vectors will always have two terms. And you know that the two terms will be one vector minus the other vector. And so it's in the same order. And th now we can do the same thing as we did with the vector A previously. We can decompose it into its constituent parts. Okay? And so we take the RB vector, RBA vector. Okay? And obviously we've got an X component to that, a Y component to that, and a, uh, a Z component to that. And obviously you multiply them by the unit vectors to get the vector RBA. Okay, and we do the same thing with RB and the same thing with RA. And that's how we decompose um, relative vectors. Now, a lot of you probably found that quite, um, you know, you've probably covered quite a lot of that before. Like I said, a lot of this stuff is in the revision notes. And so if you are unsure of it, then refer to them. And hopefully that should give you some idea of what we're talking about. And like I said, there are some examples in there and some exercises for you to have a go at. The answers to the exercises are provided. They're not, not, they're not work solutions, but the answers. So that will give you an idea of, uh, of whether you got the right answer or not. Okay, now, vector multiplication. Like I said, this is a, a, bit, a bit tougher. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through it because we use it throughout dynamics, okay, vector multiplication. It's very useful for some, ver for some of the concepts, okay, but you'll cover the details of how you multiply vectors in mathematics in your math course, which is the, is the lecture after this one, math. Um, towards the end of this semester, you'll then recover exactly what we're going on, on about. Okay, but for the time being, just take what I say as, as, uh, as in a sense, gospel. I'm, okay, I'm not going to go through the derivations of this, okay, but you do need to know about it. 
So with vectors, there are two ways you can multiply vectors together. There's the dot product and the cross product, and they're also known as the scalar or the vector product. Okay? And the dot product is represented as a dot between two vectors. So we've got two vectors A and B. You put a dot between them, and that will give you the dot product. Okay? <coughs> and there are essentially two methods to work out what the dot product is. There's an analytical method or method using maths and sums, or there's a geometric method where you draw the vectors and you can work it out from there. And so our, our analytical method in three-dimensional space, A dot B is defined as AX times BX plus AY times BY times AZ plus B, uh, times BZ. Okay? Now, uh, you'll notice that what I've done is I've just taken the X values of A and B multiply them together, and I've taken the y values of a and b, multiply them together, and the y val and the z values of a and b, and multiply them together. Okay? And that, you add all those together, and you'll get the dot product. Now, you notice that the answer has no vectors in it. It's got no unit vectors. And that's because the dot product is a scalar. Okay? It no longer has any direction. We don't care about the direction. Okay? It's just a number. And so, as I said, you take the i coefficients, you multiply them together, you take the j coefficients and you multiply them together, and you take the k coefficients, and they get multiplied together as well. Okay, and you add all those together, and you'll get a number, which will be the dot product of those vectors, a dot b. What about the geometrical method? Well, here's our two vectors, a and b, okay, and we know that there's an angle alpha between the two. Okay, now to find the dot product, what you do is, essentially you project vector b onto a, okay, and now obviously from, uh, from Sokoto we know that that's going to be the magnitude of b times by the cosine of a, okay, and sorry, cosine of alpha, and then you multiply those two values together. And so you end up projecting b onto vector a, the length of the projection is the magnitude of vector b multiplied by cosine alpha, and so a dot b also equals the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine alpha. Okay? Like I said, again, I'm not going to go through the derivation of this. You'll cover that in um, math. But essentially, we'll take this as, uh, as red right now. So that gives you um, the dot product. And we tend to use dot products when we're dealing with um, things like uh, the subject of work and energy, Okay, because that's, that's where these things will come into concept. You'll notice, because we've got a cosine alpha here, okay, what would the, what would the A dot B if, the, if alpha was 90 degrees? Sorry? Zero. Yeah, because the cosine alpha is zero. And so, and so, sorry, cosine 90 we know is zero. And so if the vectors are perpendicular to each other, the dot product we know is zero. Okay? Now we've got a little example to go through. Here I've got two vectors. I've got A is 3i minus 5j plus 6k, and B is 2j. Okay, well, what's A dot B? What do we do? We group the coefficients together, don't we? And because essentially B is 0i and 0k, we've only got a value for j, then obviously you can disregard the i and k from A, and so you just take those two together, because obviously 0 times 3 is 0, and 0 times 6 is 0, and so we have minus 5 times 2, which will give you minus 10. A dot B. Okay? Are there any questions on that? Okay? <coughs> now, here's another example, I and K. So the magnitudes are 1, and we've just got the unit vectors. What's the, what's the dot product of those two? Zero. Exactly. They're perpendicular to each other. And so we know that A dot B equals zero. Okay, so that's dot product. They're quite simple. There's some exercises at the end of this chapter that you can work on, um, which is similar to this sort of thing. Okay, now, cross product. This is the next one. And this is represented by, as you can imagine, a cross between the two. So A cross B, we've given it an answer. We've given it C. And you can see that A cross B equals C, and C is in boldface, which means it's a vector. So the answer to, the answer to a cross product is always going to be a vector. So that means it has a magnitude and a direction, okay? And so we need to define what C could possibly be. Now, with a, there are two methods. Again, we've got an analytical method and a geometric method. Okay, the analytical method involves 
setting up a matrix, okay, and calculating its determinant. And so we've got A times B, uh, sorry, A cross B. And so you, what you do, the first row of the matrix is going to be your unit vectors, I, J, and K. Okay? The second row will be your components of vector A, AX, AY, and AZ. And the third row will be BX, BY, and BZ. Okay? Now that's known as a matrix. We've got three by three matrix. And there is a rule that you can follow called Saras's rule, okay? that where you can work out what the determinant is. Okay? Um, if you've covered matrices before, then you should know what a determinant is. Okay? Um, if you haven't, um, take a look in math books. And like I said, you'll cover this in maths. But essentially what you do is you take, um, you take the, value, the first value for i, okay, and you do ay times bz. Okay, and then if you've repeated these rows, this side, okay, and this side, and there, those two sides, then you can do i times by a times by by, and they're subtracted from the one we had before. A's. And you end up essentially getting an equation that looks like this. Okay? So here's your i component, here's your j component, and then, then there you've got your z component, your, your k component. Okay? Like I said, you can just take this as red now, okay? but you notice that this is a vector. We've got value for i, a value for j, and a value for k. Okay? So it's going to give you a vector in three-dimensional space. And obviously what we can do is we can substitute those things as Cx, Cy, and Cz. Okay? And that will give us our x, y, and z component for C. And so we can say that C is those components multiply, you know, that multiplied out. Okay, so that's the cross product, the analytical method. Well, what about the geometrical method? Well, here's our two vectors, A and B, okay? And we want to determine what A cross B is, okay? Well, the rule for this is that you take, it's the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times by sine alpha, okay? So it's similar to the dot product, except for this time, we've got a, a, an angle, but it's the sine of that angle, okay? Instead of, instead of the cosine, it's the sine. So if those two vectors are on top of each other, okay, what's the value for the cross, the dot, the dot product? Sorry, the cross product. What's the value for the cross product? If they're on top of each other, what's the angle between them? And what's sine of zero? Zero, okay, so the cross product is zero if those vectors lie on top of each other, okay? Now, what about if there's an angle between them? Well, what we've got here, we've got an angle alpha um, between A and B, okay? And since we want to work out what A cross B is, you start at A, okay, and you sweep through the shortest angle to get to B, okay? Now, in this case, it's, it's just under 90 degrees or so, okay? Now, as we said, um, it's a... It's a vector, so it must have a direction as well as a magnitude, okay? And what's the, so the direction between here, you sweep through from A to B, okay? And we know that this is a, a clockwise rotation. Now, a clockwise rotation we define as going into the board, okay? Or into the page, if you're looking at the, in the, th at the book. And the thing you can think about with that, you can think about that as known as the corkscrew rule, okay? The corkscrew rule. And that will help you remember which way it will give you the direction, okay? I've got a corkscrew here. I put the uh, visualizer on, and I've got a on the visualizer. I've got a potato. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the corkscrew. Okay, and so what I'm doing is I'm rotating the corkscrew um, clockwise from where you can see. Okay, and you'll see that as I go through, obviously, the corkscrew go, comes out the other side. So the vector is in this direction. Okay, vector is in this direction. Okay. If I'm rotating clockwise, the vector goes into the board. Okay? So there we are. So, yeah, there we go. Okay? So that's how you define it. What about if you had um, the other way around? Okay? Well, if, if I had to sweep through a, um, if I had to sweep through a anti-clockwise direction, okay, then obviously I turn the corkscrew anti-clockwise and the corkscrew comes out. Okay, so the vector is in this direction. Okay, it comes out as a board. So if I've got two vectors in the plane of the screen, okay, the sh you go through the shortest angle between them. Okay, if that angle is clockwise, then the vector is into the board, and if the angle is anti-clockwise, this way, it's out of the board. Okay, you must remember that. 
Now, there's a useful way to cover that, and I'll talk about that in a second, okay? Let's get this PC back. Okay? Right. So there's, our, there's the cross product. So A cross B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times by sine of alpha, okay? And the direction you can look at just by looking at the vectors, okay? If the two vectors are in a the plane, then it's going to be perpendicular to those vectors, either into the board or out of the board, depending on the angle between the two and which way you have to go to get to the angle, okay? Are there any questions on that? Like I said, we'll cover that in a useful... We'll have, we've got a something we can usefully use for that, okay? So, obviously, if the angle is 0 or 180, then cross product is 0. And obviously, sine of alpha can be greater than or less than 0, okay? Making the magnitude of C either positive or negative, okay? So, again, we, cover, we covered this, what's the direction? And we can use this corkscrew rule. The other rule we can use is known as the right-hand rule, okay? Now, we've all got right hands, I think. Okay, no problem if you haven't. You just have to think about things slightly differently. And what you do is you take your two fingers, your first two fingers, sorry, those two fingers, okay, and you put them at 90 degrees to each other. Okay, this is with your right hand. Okay, and these two fingers represent the I and the J coordinates, okay, or vector A and vector B, okay. And so obviously to get between A and B, I'm moving right-handed, okay. So what you do is you stick out your thumb and that will denote the direction of the vector. Okay. So as I said, you've got A and B, you moved clockwise between the two, and your thumb will denote the direction. Okay? Now if I was looking at it this way around, here it would be anti-clockwise, so the thumb would denote that I'm going in that direction now. Okay? This is known as the right hand rule. Okay. Take your two fingers. Your first finger is going to be your first value in your cross product, A. Your second finger, which is 90 degrees to that, we call B. Okay? Now, to work out the direction of C, our answer, A cross B, you stick your thumb out. Okay? This is called the right-hand rule. And it's a really easy way to remember which direction the vectors go. Okay? <laughs> and so, I, as I said, if you've got a clockwise rotation between A and B, the vector's in that direction. And if you've got an anti-clockwise direction between A and B, then the vectors are out of the board. Out of. Okay, that's the right hand rule. <coughs> and like I said, this with cross products, we use it all the time with things like angular momentum and torques, okay? And so it's quite important that you know how to deal with the right hand rule. You've got A and B, okay, which are your first two fingers, and your thumb is the direction. And as I said, if you've got A times B, the direction was into the board, okay, when we looked at our example. And for B times A, which is the other way around, it's out of the board, okay? If you swap the A and B vectors around, then the, the shortest angle between them would be an anti-clockwise rotation. And so from the, from the um, right-hand rule, the direction is out of the board, okay? And we denote in and out of the screen, okay, perpendicular vectors to the thing that we're looking at. A circle with a cross is essentially the tail of a vector, okay? You're looking, imagine a vector is like a, a dart, okay? And at the end of the dart, you've got the flex, okay? And those flex are denoted by the cross, okay? If you've got a dart coming towards you, you can see a point, okay? Which is what the point is inside a circle when the vector is coming out at you, okay? And so we can say that... Um, so obviously, the vector, the magnitude is going to be the same for A times B or, or A cross B or B cross A, okay? But we know that the directions are opposite. So we can say that A cross B equals minus B cross A. And so those vectors are not, that um, operation, the cross product, is not commutative. You can't do, you need to make sure that you've got them the right way around, okay? A cross B is not the same as B cross A, okay? It's not like multiplication or addition, okay? It's different to that. You need to make sure that you get the order correct. And so this is our right-hand rule, as we've, as we've covered. Um, here's my hand. Okay, and if you've got A and B, we know that the um, magnitude is going to be um, where your thumb directs. Okay, that's covered in the notes. Okay, and as an example, let's say, let's suppose we've got A equals I and B equals J. Okay, well they're perpendicular to each other. We know the magnitudes of those two. Okay, okay, 
And obviously A, Y and AZ and BX and BZ are zero. And we could, if we wanted to, go to our Saris's rule in that matrix and work out what it is. But it's quite simple just to use your right-hand rule. Okay? The, ve the vectors are perpendicular, which happens to be where your um, first and second finger are. Okay? And so we know we can work out where the direction of that is. Obviously, the magnitude is going to be 1. And so A cross B. And so there we are. No, there. So essentially you had one of the things was running along the x-axis, okay? The second finger was coming along the y-axis, and so your um, thumb would be the z-axis, okay? And this is known as the right-handed coordinate system, okay? So there, there it is in all its glory, x, y, and z, and you've got i, j, and k. And if you orient your right hand such that i and j run, a, your, run along your sec first and second finger, you'll find that z happens to be in the k direction. And so let's see. That's x, that's y, z is in the upwards direction. Okay? This is the standard coordinate system that we use in dynamics. Okay? And so that, that example that we looked at ages and ages ago, when we looked at vectors, let's see, it's in here somewhere. No, that, no not that one. Is it in here somewhere? Yeah, okay. Notice that this coordinate system has been set up in a right-handed coordinate way. So it's not, it wasn't, you know, it was drawn in this way on purpose because that is a right-handed coordinate system. If you put your first finger down X and your second finger down Y, then Z would be where your thumb goes, okay? <coughs> so, right-handed coordinate system, like I said, you can also think of it as a corkscrew going into a cork, or in this case a potato, Okay, or you can think of it as a screwdriver. Again, remember with the screwdriver, it's righty tighty, lefty loosey. Okay, you turn right, it goes in. You turn left, it comes out. Okay, clockwise in, anti-clockwise out. Okay. So there's your right-handed coordinate system. Okay, and like I said, if A is I and B is J, then the answer C is going to be K. Now, that's, this is this defines our right-handed coordinate system. Okay. If, a, if i times j gives you k, then you have a right-handed coordinate system. If i times j gives you negative k, you haven't got a right-handed coordinate system and you will get the wrong answers. This whole, all this cross-product stuff doesn't work if you decide to have a left-handed coordinate system. Okay? You will get the wrong answer. So you must always make sure that when you're drawing a, a coordinate system in three-dimensional space, that you use a right-handed coordinate system. Then things like the cross-product work. Okay? The rules that we know, learn about the cross-product work. Okay, so you must always make sure that it is essential that you draw yourself a set of right-handed coordinate systems where i cross j equals k. Okay, like I said, if i cross j equals minus k, you've got it wrong. It needs to change. Okay, i cross j equals k. This is essential to, that you uh, remember that. Now, so now we've, we've defined our coordinate system, okay, and we've learned about vector multiplication and vector decomposition, okay? Now, how does, this, how does all this stuff relate to dynamics, okay? Well, dynamics is all about the motion of, of either particles or rigid bodies, and we'll cover what they are next week, okay? But it's all about their motion, okay? We've got dynamics can be divided into two things, kinematics, which is where we're looking at where they go, and kinetics, which is how much force is required to make them move, Okay? And so we're also always talking about motion. And as we know, there are three things that define motion. There's position, where something is. There's its velocity, how fast it's going. And its acceleration, how quickly it's increasing in speed, okay, or in velocity. And so we've got our vector, RT, this time. And we assume that the point P is moving around our three-dimensional space, okay? So its position is changing with time. Now, position we've denoted as R, okay? And so we can decompose RT into its constituent parts, as we did before. Okay? Position P, uh, point P is defined as the vector RT, okay? and we can decompose that into its constituent parts. So we've got XT, YT, and ZT. Okay? They're all values of magnitude along the X, Y, and Z axes okay, that vary with respect to time. And by multiplying by the unit vectors, okay, you end up getting a vector RT, which is our position vector with respect to time. Now, velocity, 
Okay, yeah, so yeah, well, that's what I've said. And velocity, we know, is a differential of position divided by time, okay? DRT over DT, okay? Now, what we can do with that is obviously we take the first differential of x, t, okay? First differential of y, t, first differential of z, t, and we have a vector defining velocity. And notice the notation here. I'm using what's known as dot notation, where you have a dot over a number that it signifies it's the first derivative with respect to time, okay? And likewise, two dots is the second derivative with respect to time. And so we can look at acceleration, and essentially it's the same thing. We know that acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time, okay? And so we have x double dot t times i plus y double dot t times <coughs> j plus z double dot t uh, times k, okay? And that will give us our acceleration in the x, y, and z axes. And so by taking one of those terms from each of those equations, let's take, say we took the x term, we have x t times i, which is our position in the x direction. We've got x dot t times i, which is our velocity in the, in the x direction. And we've got x double dot t times i, which is our acceleration in the, z dire in the um, i direction or x direction. Okay, and so by knowing those three terms, we have completely defined that position of point P in the x direction. And you can do the same thing with the y direction and the same thing with the z direction. You put them all together and you've got the complete description of that point, P, wherever it is in three-dimensional space using a right-handed coordinate system. Okay? You've got the component of position, component of velocity is up here, and the component of acceleration are up here. And you, Like I said, you can take, take all the x terms that will give you in the x direction, or the y terms will be in the y direction, and the z terms will be in the z direction. Okay? And if you put them all together, you get the um, definition of that point P, wherever it is. Okay, and often the problems we face in dynamics can often actually, we often actually neglect one of the axes. We don't deal very frequently with stuff that's in three dimensions. And so what we can do is we often just deal in X and Y, okay? So I and J unit vectors. And uh, what, you can, what we end up doing is we separate these things out, we solve them individually, then we put them back together to get the total motion, okay? Because it's a lot easier just to deal with uh, one direction as opposed to trying to deal in two directions at the same time. Okay, so in summary, vectors, as we said, they need a magnitude and a direction to be fully described. Okay, and we denote them with bold face text or in handwritten work, with an arrow over the top, okay? Vector decomposition allows us to, to decompose a vector into constituent parts. And often we define these constituent parts as, as, as along a, the axes of a right-handed coordinate system, i, j, and k, okay, or x, y, and z. And so we have scalars, which are the, you know, uh, ax, and a, y, and a, z are all scalar values. You multiply them by the unit vectors to get the vector, okay? you add them together, and you end up getting your total vector. The magnitudes, that's the square root of the, of the scalar parts squared, added together, okay? And we have an equation for theta and an equation for phi. And these are theta and phi as defined in your notes, okay? Your notes. The dot product is denoted as A dot B. And basically, with the dot product, you just take your I components, your J components, your K components, you multiply those components together and then add the whole lot together to get the dot product, okay? The other possibility is where you take the magnitudes of A and B, you multiply it by the cosine of alpha, which is the angle between the two, and that will also give you a number which should be the same as the number that you get at the top. The resultant of a dot product is a scalar, has no direction, okay? And we deal with the dot product when we're dealing with things like work and energy. Now, the cross product, okay, A cross B, is a bit more complicated, okay? We use Saris's rule on that matrix. Like I said, in, in the notes, you can uh, see what we've done. And like I said, in maths, you'll, you'll derive where Saris's rule comes from. But for the time being, if you just take um, those values, what I'm going to do is, in fact, I'll, I will just quickly go through it since I've got the time. Saris's rule, like I said, we want to work out what A cross B is, okay, A cross B. So we set up a matrix, okay, we've got I, 
J. These are vectors, and K. Notice the arrow over the top, OK? Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll just do it over here because it'll be easier to describe I, J, and K. OK? And so we then write AX, AY, and AZ here. And then below that, we write BX, BY, and BZ here. OK? So there's our matrix. And we want to work out what the determinant of that matrix is. That's what those straight lines are for. And what you do to work out the determinant is you just repeat this line over here, AX, AY, and AZ. And this line over here, BX, BY, BZ. OK? And then you do the same thing over here. We've got AZ, AY, AX, and then BX, BY, BZ. Okay, we want to work out where does that equation come from? This one here. Where does that equation come from? The first one. <coughs> what you do, what you do is you take I, okay, and you go down this axis, okay, so you've got I times by AY times by BZ, okay, so that's plus. And then you take this line out down here, and that's minus, minus AZ here times by BY. OK? And you do the same thing with J, plus this, minus this. So you've got plus J times by AX, sorry, A, uh, what have we got? No, AZ times by BX minus AX times by BZ. OK, and then plus K is the same thing. Take K, got AX, BY, minus AY, BX. OK, that's how we, that's Saris's rule, OK? Like I said, you'll right, you go through this in more detail in maths, but that's essentially where it comes from. That's why it looks so complicated. OK, so the cross product is known as A cross B, OK? You can use Saris's rule in the matrix method or geometrical method, where alpha is the angle between A and B, OK? And if those vectors are in the plane, OK, and by definition two vectors must be in some plane, the angle of the, your resultant of A cross B is going to be perpendicular to those vectors, either into the page or out of that, either into the plane or out of the plane, OK? And we can look at that as using the corkscrew rule, or we can use the right-hand rule, OK? And if A moving to B requires a clockwise rotation, it's into the board, and if it requires an anti-clockwise rotation, it's out of the board, OK? <coughs> and the cross product is used when dealing with torques and angular momentum. OK. And as we said, a right-handed coordinate system <coughs> is used throughout this course, and it's, it's a coordinate system where I cross... J equals K, OK? It must equal positive K. You must use your right hand. So, lastly, the motion of a particle, as we said, we can define it in the component forms by decomposing vector R into its component forms. We've got this position. Then, obviously, the velocity is going to be the first derivative of R, of the position, OK? And using the dot notation, we have what's shown here. And then, Obviously, the acceleration is going to be the um, derivative of velocity with respect to time. And so you have the double dot notation, and um, it's defined as here. OK. Thank you very much. That should be the end. Yep. OK.